we are going to continue with amalgamation or hybridity, how many cultures came together and evolved. And this is the case of pulque. Pulque, consaro de maguey, agave plant, and continue to be of great importance in the life of the Mexicanos, as, as it was for the Aztecs. Pulque in agua is otli, which is an alcoholic drink made from the fermented honey water, aguamiel in Spanish. The juice is sucked from the center of the plant, which is extracted. And it's also used for many other purposes, from the leaf to the spines of the plants, to make bags, um, to make fabrics. So from the time of the Aztecs to the present time, pulque has been of a great importance. So I'm going to let um, Professor Joan Bristol, who does an amazing job of connecting the pulque to ethnicity and race throughout colonial times and up to where we are in the present. So I'm going to let her do the explanation. And this came out of a panel discussion on Mesoamerica, uh, a part of a symposium on mestizaje, hybridity, and cultural entanglements in colonial Latin America. And it was done through the Library of Congress. So let's listen to what Dr. Joan Bristol have to say. Um, and I'm going to let her do the explanation because she did this as a part of a dissertation in a book that she wrote. Here she goes. From the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much for coming. Um, thank you, Ralph, for inviting me, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, today I'm going to talk about the way <coughs> that pulque, a fermented beverage, was used as a way to talk about race and especially about indigeneity <coughs> in the colonial period in Mexico in a way that has resonance for the present. Um, and I should say that the remarks are drawn from a chapter that I wrote for an edited volume that I think Marcy wrote the introduction for, um, called um, Substance and Seduction, Ingested Commodities in Colonial Mesoamerica, the Atlantic World, and Beyond, which was edited by um, Catherine Sampek and Stacey Schwarzkopf. So it will be coming out in print. Um, but it's also a work in progress because it is part of a larger book. So pulque is an alcoholic beverage which is made by fermenting the sap of the maguey plant, which is also called the agave. And here we have a picture. Um, and then is this, oh, and then this is a, this is a picture of a, a, a tlachiquero, a person who is um, taking the sap from the maguey plant through a gourd, and then the sap will be made into pulque. Um, Mesoamericans have been drinking pulque for probably millennia. Um, there's some debate about how old it is, um, although its popularity has waxed and waned, particularly in the past 100 years or so. Um, pulque is quite perishable, so it usually only lasts for a few days, maybe up to a week after it's finished fermenting, um, although recently some companies have begun canning it for export. And so we, here we have pulque la lucha, and we'll come back to that. Um, the alcohol level varies, so I think it, it can be as low as 2 to 3% alcohol. Um, I looked at public uh, health records from the early, uh, the early 20th century in Mexico City, and there the alcohol content seemed to be like 3 to 4%. I think that this canned pulque is 5% um, alcohol. So probably for as long as people have been talking about pulque, they've been arguing about issues of moderation and abuse. So in the 1540s, um, Friar Toribio de Motolinia said that pulque made indigenous people, quote, violently drunk and accordingly more cruel and bestial. Although he then went on to say, actually, however, if taken with moderation, pulque is wholesome and very nutritious. <laughs> and this is this contrast you see in a lot of, I have many examples. Um, so you can see here in this quotation, in addition to the issues of moderation and abuse, you can see that Spaniards, as well as indigenous people, saw this as an indigenous product that was consumed by indigenous people, although in fact, like everybody drank it um, in many different settings. Um, this multilinear quotation also points to the fact that colonial chroniclers tended to discuss pulque through categories of order and disorder, purity and mixture, and health and vice. So as Mary Douglas and others have explained, these sorts of ideas about purity and pollution are often used to maintain boundaries and reinforce social hierarchies. 
And this connection between purity and social order is particularly obvious in colonial debates over mixed pulque. So pulque sellers mixed pulque with all kinds of things, um, with fruit, with meat, um, occasionally with peyote and with herbs and different kinds of roots. Um, and so for Spanish officials, pure pulque, which they call pulque blanco, or like literally white pulque, um, pulque blanco was tolerable. I mean, sort of more or less tolerable at different times, but overall generally tolerable. But mixing it with anything made it bad in the eyes of Spanish officials. As early as 1529, Spanish officials prohibited the sale of pulque mixed with any other ingredient, and this regulation continued throughout the colonial period. So viceregal decrees of 1535, 1671, and 1792 prohibited yellow pulque, and they called yellow pulque corrupt. Um, and they defined this yellow pulque as having, quote, the root, the raíz that strengthens it, causing drunkenness that is dangerous to health and to good customs, and from which cr come the crimes, sins, and abominations that we see continually. So these decrees proclaimed that public stands must sell only pulque that was, quote, pure and clean of all confection, mixture, root, or corruption. Um, and the root that they were talking about was palo de timbre. Um, and this is when I, like, I Googled. I Googled palo de timbre. And it, this came up on a culinary website. Um, so, uh, so this is a plant that is still used to speed up fermentation. And according to this culinary website, all different parts of it can be used to speed fermentation and still are used. So it could be the leaves, it could be the branches. So I don't know, when they say raíz or root, I don't know if they're really talking about the root or if the branch maybe was used and it looked like a root, but they're talking about this palo de timbre. Um, so palo de timbre was mentioned in many other texts, including the 1681 Recopilación de Leyes de los Reinos de Indias, the compilation of um, the colonial laws. Um, and the recopilación warned against the damaging effects of, quote, introducing ingredients to pulque that are noxious to spiritual and temporal health. Um, legislators described the Indian practice of, quote, mixing it with certain roots, boiling water, and lime, which makes it so strong that it makes them, indigenous people, lose their senses. Then, they went on, then being alienated, they commit idolatries, make ceremonies, and Gentile sacrifices. Um, so it's not just that Spanish officials tolerated the consumption of pure or white pulque, but they actually made money from its sale, so they had like you know, skin in the game. Um, in 1668, the crown established the Asiento de Pulque, they named it administrator to collect pulque taxes, and then in 1763, pulque taxation became the responsibility of the Real Hacienda, or the Royal Treasury. So this, this seems somewhat paradoxical. So if collecting tax money was the primary concern of crown and vice regal authorities, why would they ban the sale of mixed pulque, from which they could also make money? So it's not surprising that officials would want to prohibit the sale of pulque with like, things like peyote or maybe other kinds of materials that had obvious pharmacological properties. Um, and in fact, Daniel Nemser, who has written about these issues for the late um, 17th century, um, has shown that Spaniards actually thought of pulque that had been mixed with certain materials as fundamentally altered and different from pulque blanco. So he quotes a theologian as using the term transubstantiate to talk about this. So this is a material that's totally different. Um, but we might ask what's the problem with adding fruit or meat or other, you know, adulterating it in other kinds of ways. So the fact that officials were not profiting from all pulque, but were in fact, in fact trying to discourage the consumption of some pulque, suggests that pulque regulations had to do with concern, concerns that were not strictly financial. So I want to suggest that the reason that Spanish officials prohibited mixed pulque was at least in part because of its mixed nature. So we know very well that Spaniards valued purity of blood. So to ha have high status or to occupy certain um, positions, you had to prove that you had limpieza de sangre, or you know, translated as purity of blood, meaning really that you could prove that you were an old Christian, but it's sort of in, in sort of in fact kind of meant that you could prove you were of European descent. Um, presumably, um, Spaniards also looked for purity in the substances that went into physical bodies. Um, and so my favorite example to describe this conjunction of ideas about pulque and ideas about blood lineage comes in a set of responses to a survey of drinking habits that the viceregal government sent out in 1783. And so there's a survey, what do you drink, what's it made out of, when do you drink it? And so this yielded a great list of alcoholic drinks, you know, saying where these things were drunk and what went into them and this kind of thing. And so most of these recipes were sort of neutrally explanatory. So for example, to make a drink that is called mantequilla, which I, in this period I think would translate literally as lard, I don't know why it's called mantequilla, um, but informants reported that they, quote, mixed aguardientes, which is distilled alcohol, and pulque and sugar or some other sweetener. So this was a mixture, but this is reported in a sort of matter-of-fact way. 
Um, in this list, a drink called coyote stands out. So coyote was, quote, composed of inferior pulque, dark honey, and palo de timbre, this plant. Um, and putting it in an infusion, it gets stronger, and people drink it, although it's very harmful. And the term is nocivo. The term always, I translated, I think, as noxious at one point, and then I sometimes translate it as harmful, but, but it's, always, uh, it's almost always nocivo. So that's interesting, um, you know, that this word is like through the century sort of repeated in relation to this mixed, mixed pulque. Um, so the name of this drink, this, the name coyote, is striking. Um, in the eight, as you, I'm sure, know, in the 18th century, the term coyote was used to describe a person of mixed descent, theoretically one who was three quarters indigenous and one quarter Spanish. Um, so liquid coyote, oh, and okay, I did have a slide, I couldn't remember. So liquid coyotes and human coyotes then were both characterized by mixture. So the description of the beverage coyote as harmful and low grade recalls some contemporary Spanish ideas that castas, or people of mixed racial background, including so-called coyotes, were inferior, dangerous, and disorderly. So in 1763, the Capuchin chronicler Francisco de Ajofrin wrote, um, quote, lobos, cambu cambujos, and coyotes, these are these categories of mixed people, are fierce people of bizarre customs. Um, this is not the only kind of depiction of these, these castas or these mixed people. So I brought, I brought these cast paintings because they show people drinking pulque. So you can sort of see what it might have you know, been like in action. Um, but you can also see that these are, these are paintings of mixed people, but they show this sort of harmonious um, family unit. And then those, those of you to whom I spoke before this note, really, I was like sort of confused because the cast painting that we have on our program today actually doesn't have coyote. So I don't know what, what that means, but we could talk about that. Um, so the connection between lineage, sorry, liquids and lineage is clear in a 1611 Spanish dictionary in which the noun mezcla, or mixture, was defined as, quote, the incorporation of a liquid with another. Um, and its verb form, this dictionary, me, di, this dictionary defined mezclar, the verb to mix, as meaning, quote, to unite diverse things. Um, and then the example was, quote, to, to mix the lineages when some lineages are mixed up with others that are not of the same calidad or quality. Um, the dictionary went on to say, and we say it is a thing without mixture when it's pure, so purity, mixture, or opposites. Um, calidad, used, the word used in the 1611 dictionary in a general way, meaning sort of quality or type, was also used to indicate social status in the colonial period. So there are several ways to approach these Spanish fears about these mixed drinks. Um, so first, um, these, this kind of, the, these rules and legislation reflect a sort of material solution to fears about mixing. So Spanish officials feared that the mixing of liquids and other ingredients in pulque drinks because the re resulting inebriation could lead to the mixing of bodies and ultimately the mixing of blood, both in terms of like the bloodshed that comes from violence um, and also the mixing of lineages that could, you know, um, happen when people had sex with each other and had kids together. Um, so po possibly through pulque-fueled sexual relations. Um, so we see an example of this in the ban of sales of all pulque after the 1692 bread riots in Mexico City. So in this, it, right after these, these riots, officials claimed that the insurrection had been planned in pulquerias, and then they banned pulque briefly. There was like a little bit of a disagreement between the Crown and the viceregal government. Um, and Daniel Nemser, this person I mentioned before, has talked in, at length about this. Um, this is, he wrote an article about this. He said, the study of mixed pulque offered elites a language for talking about race mixing, mestizaje, while simultaneously constitu constituting pulque consumers as a seditious collective subject, a plebe defined like pulque by mixing. So he's talking about this issue in this period. Um, so as Nemser's work indicates, this worry about mixing pulque was also a manifestation of biopower, biopolitics in the way that Foucault has talked about it. So by claiming to protect colonial residents from the disorderly effects of mixing pulque, the state was trying to control their bodies and their actions. And it was then also another way to sort of perpetuate this discourse as, about mixing as undesirable and corrupting and bad. Um, Spanish officials were not only worried about Spanish identity being adulterated, however, but they were also worried about indigenous identity being adulterated. And we see this like all over the place. So we see this in regular um, decrees prohibiting Spaniards, blacks, and castas, mixed people, from living in indigenous villages. And we also see this in the two republic idea, the idea that um, the colonial world should be split up sort of juridically and also spatially into the República de Indios and the República de Españoles, although it's like only a, a fantasy, it never works. Um, 
So ideas about pure Indianness and pure pulque and the importance of maintaining the purity of both were linked in crown and viceregal policies limiting the sale of the permitted white pulque to indigenous sellers. Decrees from 1608, 1635, and 1639 restricted licenses for selling pulque to indigenous women. Um, although in practice, Spaniards as well as men of different groups were involved in the trade in Mexico City, certainly by the 18th century, possibly before. Um, religious leaders were specifically worried about Spanish culture polluting indigenous people. Um, in the mid-16th century, the friar Diego Duran condemned mixed pulque, writing, writing, quote, today what is called pulque, made by Spaniards from the black honey and water with the root in it, was never known to the ancients, meaning sort of the Nahua people before contact. He's writing in central Mexico. Um, nor did they know how to concoct it until the blacks and Spaniards invented it. Um, and so this seems to be the recipe for coyote that we see later, much later, 200 years later, in the, 17, in the 1783 text that I talked about earlier. Um, Duran then goes on to describe white pulque as, um, quote, their own native wine, which is lighter and medicinal, meaning Nahua people's native wine, um, and then describes this mixed variant as, quote, diabolical, stinking, black, potent, rough, without flavor or taste. Um, so again, so mixture makes pulque diabolical, while white pulque is both purely indigenous and better and more wholesome, but also kind of rooted in the past. Um, in his 1634 Nahuatl confession manual, Bartolome de Alba addressed indigenous Mexicans directly, I mean, sort of, um, lamenting that, quote, for a gourd of pulque or a cup of wine, you cast your souls to hell and give them to the devil. Um, and he claimed that before contact with Spaniards, Nahua people, quote, had discretion, prudence, fear, shame, and good breeding. But he said that now they had been turned into beasts by drunkenness and intoxication. So he wrote, even though the ancients your elders drank, <clears throat> excuse me, it was with moderation and restraint as your neighbors the Spaniards do today, which I don't really know what to make of that. But, um, and if by some chance they sometimes used to discover some drunkard, they immediately took away his life for it. And now in our times it exists because nobody restrains you with the death penalty. And this is actually in reference to this idea um, that comes from the Florentine Codex that under the Aztecs, the drinking of pulque was restricted to um, ritual specialists and the elderly, <clears throat> although it seems that this was this never really this was not really the case, but there's this um, people think that this is the case. Um, so Duran and Alba then were idealizing the past, this Nahua past, um, and using pulque as a way to argue for the need to protect, but really to regulate native bodies. Um, yet in reality, of course, people and practices were actively mixing in all kinds of ways. Um, Friar Ilarione da Bergamo, who was an Italian Capuchin who tra traveled in New Spain in the 1760s, described maguey in this way. So maguey, the plant, right, from which pulque comes. So he says, as you can read, um, this plant is also held in special esteem by the most blessed Virgin Mary, um, because in the year 1540 she appeared <clears throat> to an Indian named Juan de Aguila on the hill of Tototopec, which is not far from Mexico City, and told him that he should look for her image in the very same place. After initial efforts, he found in the middle of one of these plants a small statue of the Blessed Virgin with her babe in her arms, though it is not known from what material it is made. The Mexicans show great faith and devotion to this, and in time of greatest need, they have a special recourse to it through public prayers. So what does this sound like? It sounds like the Virgin of Guadalupe, right? So, so um, the Virgin of Guadalupe, just nine years before, had appeared to Juan Diego at Tepeyac, um, and she you know, appears in this hill where Tonantzin was important, this earlier deity. Um, this description also calls to mind Maya Huel, who is the goddess of maguey and pulque, depicted in both the Codex Mendoza and then here of an image from the Codex Borgia, um, as a woman with 400 breaths nursing a baby while sitting in a maguey plant. And so, you know, this is how it's been interpreted. So. Um, However, pulque was, pragmatic, was, uh, was hybrid in a more pragmatic way as well. So it was hybrid just because lots of people drank it in many different situations. So the same Italian friar wrote, um, today consumption <clears throat> of pulque is so widespread that everyone drinks it. There are public pulquerias, which are like our public wine shops. A few years ago, it was not proper for people with any kind of social standing to go into them because entering a place frequented only by drunks and by rabble of every ilk seemed to undercut their respectability. Now people of every rank frequent them, and during the time of my stay in Mexico, I observed many carriages and coaches of gentlemen, ladies, merchants, and other respectable people heading to these places. And this is my favorite part. As for myself, in the roughly five years that I resided in that country, I could not get used to drinking that liquor because of its foul odor, even though Europeans, after drinking it for two or three days, became even more keen on it than the local population itself. 
So Bergamo here is obviously participating in this sort of discourse that sees Spanish Creoles as sort of degraded because of their American origins. Um, but it's also in interesting because it shows, um, and, and he's saying in this period, but I think it's true, it's definitely true earlier as well, that pulque consumption was, of course, not only limited to indigenous people. However much the discourse about pulque revolved around identifying them as, as the primary pulque drinkers. So ultimately, I'm interested in the way that this colonial pulque discourse may or may not foreshadow ideas about indigeneity and Mexican identity in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. <clears throat> so after 21, I'm sorry, after 1821, caste distinctions and ethnic privileges and protections were abolished by liberal policymakers. After 1910, mixture was celebrated. Um, the idea of the Indian as part of the cosmic race really became a linchpin for Mexican national identity. And the idea here was that the Indian was part of the past while the mestizo was the future. And I should say, going back to the 19th century, Deborah Toner has written this wonderful book um, which I can't remember the name of, but about the, about the representations of alcohol and drunkenness and the relationship to national identity in the 19th century. So that's a very good book. Um, but so the modern, in the modernization products of the early um, to mid 20th century, pulque sort of fell behind. So the state actually encourages beer consumption over pulque consumption. Um, beer was taxed less heavily. There weren't as many hygienic regulations. Um, the state was subsidizing some of the beer producers. Um, and in part, this is because it's seen as sort of modern and progressive and clean. Um, and pulque is characterized as not clean in this period. Um, now in the 21st century, pulque is having a resurgence as middle class students and all kinds of people go to pulquerias, and it's very, very hip. And that's the word that's always used to describe it. Um, so the New York Times and the LA Times have had articles <clears throat> in their travel sections within the past five years or so, <clears throat> um, which emphasize how pulque is sort of a symbol of Mexicanness. So much of the current pulque discourse revolves around defining Mexico through a purely indigenous past. And so here we have, again, pulque la lucha. Um, this is advertised, as you can see it down there in that like ribbon on the bottom. It says, um, it's older than tequila, stronger than beer. It's the original drink of Mexico. And the website uh, go, claims that the drink, quote, survived the ravages of the European invaders for three centuries prior to the formation of the Republic of Mexico. I mean, I guess none of these things are really not are untrue, you know, but. It, um, but it's sort of the way they're using it to advertise. That's interesting. Um, the New York Times describes pulque in one of these travel um, articles as, quote, a thick and pungent 2,000-year-old Aztec drink, even though the Aztecs were not 2,000 years old, um, and, quote, a toast to the Aztec gods. Um, so I'll end by saying that it's tempting to see historical continuities between the colonial and modern idealizations of indigenous identity and the effort to discursively define Indians as pure in both cases. Um, and that was really where my emphasis lay, I think, when I first started thinking about this. Um, but when we examine this more closely, we see a rupture with the colonial past as well. Today's pulque discourse emphasizes the mixed nature of Mexican identity and in many ways relegates its indigenous identity to the past. However, throughout the colonial period, indigenous people were a central concern of the Spanish colonial authorities and one of the ways that Spanish authorities tried to contain indigenous people and their, economics, uh, sorry, and their economic activities was specifically through this pulque discourse. Thank you. <laughs>